All right, so it looks like it's just after 11. Uh, hello, let me introduce myself. My name is Chris Keeler. I am CEO, CTO, VFX, VR supervisor, or well, one of the supervisors at uh, my company, Molecule. Uh, we're based out of New York and Los Angeles. We have about 80 employees. We, uh, we do primarily television and feature films, some commercial work. Um, and when I say we do that, I mean we do the visual effects for uh, for TV and film. Uh, company is about twelve years old now. I'd say we've probably done well over a hundred different shows, different TV shows, as well as probably uh, fifty or so feature films. And this is stuff that you guys have definitely seen. I mean, we did uh, we calculated we did seven percent of the visual effects for U.S. And to the market, which is pretty awesome. Uh, obviously, VR is coming, and everybody's taking a different approach to it. I think the uh, architectural approach, medical, scientific, there's all these other things. We're coming at it from an entertainment standpoint. Uh, so, just to help me out, I don't know where you guys are coming from. Are you programmers? Are you inter you know, in the media entertainment industries? Is it Science, like what you know, have any of you produced a VR film before or even thought about it? Okay, or maybe written a video game or anything like that. Okay, all right. Uh, do you need to study computer vision or optical flow or do you, you work in that space at all? Um, unlike real estate, for instance, or other forms of real time rendering, our primary goal in film and TV is to. Get it all in the can and get it to play back. Right? We want to. We want to be able to present material to the largest number of people possible with the lowest threshold of hardware requirements. So, what we're producing, you could watch it on Vive, or you can watch it on the PS3, but you can also watch it on Google Cardboard. You can watch it at home. You know, build it out of a pizza box. So, you know, we're really trying to uh, approach kind of the, the mass appeal of VR and find what. Aspects of entertainment in VR are yet to be discovered, and find out how sticky it is, and how distributable it is, and um, and where we want to go next. So, we just finished the the closest thing you could call to a feature VR project. It's about thirty six minutes long, I think, which is long for VR. It's not often that you're going to sit in a headset for that long and be immersed in the world, and really just the the whole industry hasn't quite come around to a place where the funding is there for massive projects, where the script writing hasn't quite gotten there because there is a difference between scripting for a standard uh, rectangular frame versus a spherical space. It changes the story, it changes blocking, it changes what effects are going to work, it changes audio. Audio is huge, uh, especially if you're mixing in Amazonic 360 audio. That's a whole different ballgame than traditional film and media. Uh, this one is directed by Doug Ryman. Um, I'm sure you guys have probably seen Born Identity and uh, Born Ultimatum. Actually, he didn't do Born Ultimatum. But uh, Edge of Tomorrow, one of my favorite films ever, that uh, Doug did that. So, I want to show you guys the trailer. Have you ever heard of Invisible yet? Does it, does it kind of read? Okay. There was a great write up in Wired Magazine recently about it. something for me. The girl is an ash that no one knows about her. We can do what we want with her. She's the key to our future. 
You know, my grandfather left a message for me before he died. He said someone was going to kill him. This is playing back so poorly, and I apologize. Um, I wonder if I should switch real quick. Is that better, or should we move on? I think I should switch. So what we were just watching is what we call uh, director's view, which really means that the uh, material has been converted from rectangular space to, to the view you would see in a headset. And that's a very useful format for us because uh, a lot of times... Step into my scary world for a second. Yeah. <laughs> Alright, so let's try one more. How do I get audio? It should be playing to the HDMI. Um, I mean, I mentioned that Wired Magazine actually ran this. It was really frustrating to see, but it's an indicator as to where the I, Dr. Richard Ashley, because being of sound it, mind, have chosen to leave my entire fortune and my line, granddaughter Tatiana Ashley. The last one of this, expecting people to know what to do with Tatiana. So it's an interesting little. I don't even you know what a lat long. I want you to do something for me. Um, a lot of times, if you're working in real time rendering, things like that. You know, my grandfather left a message for me before he died. He said someone was going to kill him. He was delusional. Like I said, that's the director's view of, of what we did. <coughs> I'll show you the lap on. Today's top story. We're watching the same thing. Ashley, exactly. Ashley, 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 this is the way that we normally work. Our, our end deliverable is this. And then the headset decodes it and uses, you know, orientation cues and everything else to create the cropped in version, which is, which is what you kind of thought. I, Dr. Richard Ashley, being of sound mind, have chosen to leave my entire fortune to my granddaughter. I mean, I think there's some obvious things to point out here. It's, it's really boring. Well, he's on our way to New York. Thank 
it cuts I when you smoke, and you don't know where to look, and you can't exactly tell them what, what is important. There's an ash that no one knows about. You want to come out on your own, you're not getting an Amazonic mix, so if something's happening behind you, you don't. You don't know that it's My grandfather left a message for me before he died. He said someone was going to kill him. He was Okay, so unlike real-time rendering, which is coming from a game engine, possibly Unity or Unreal or something like that, um, almost everything we do is coming from a photograph game. So the whole process of capturing in 360 is, in a sense, like, I mean, you see how all the te technologies are coming together, right? There's all these kind of holy grails hanging out there. If you could capture 360 material and transmit it to someone else and add AR on top of it, you would virtually be somewhere, right? Or if you could render at full frame rate, full photographic, you know, photo real quality at all times, you would, you would be in this other place. Um, our focus right now is trying to figure out if you're capturing material in 360, what's the best way to make it stereoscopic? What's the best workflow around that? How do you edit it? How do you, you know, you don't want to reinvent every single tool from scratch. You want to use the tools you have to the best of your ability. So I'm going to show some techniques for that. Um, so, starting with production, how did we record what's there? It took a lot of stuff, a whole lot of gear. Uh, this is probably about half of just the photographic equipment that we used, which on the final wrap day, uh, it's funny because this is a ping pong table because Doug Lyman loves ping pong. So, we were at his house, and we just laid everything out for the picture of it. Uh, There's a lot of interesting gadgets here. We had a gear VR on set because we were always stitching things to make sure we were shooting the right stuff. Sony A7S, that's a regular old DSLR camera, but we would put that on a pano head, which is a, a type of uh, tripod head that puts the nodal point of the camera at the rotational nodal center of, of its pivot points. Uh, that's a structure I.O. scanner, which lets you capture things similar to Matterport, but it's different technology. These ones on top, these are the jaunt cameras. Each one of us has 24 lenses. It's about the size of a basketball. There's four lenses up, four lenses down, and 16 around the center. They're all very precisely positioned against each other. Uh, the, the chassis is actually known, and that's a big factor in how we solve for that camera. Uh, these ones down below are GoPros with the Intenai lenses coming out of Japan. These are really unique lenses. This one here captures 280 degrees field of view, right? So that means it shoots this way, but it captures all the way back to here. Big. Like, you can't actually get out of the way of the lens if you're near the camera. It's virtually impossible. These ones are 220 lenses. So things to point out, you've got an inner pupillary distance here, which on GoPros is probably about 2 inches, 3 inches. The jaw is slightly bigger. Um, the inner pupillary is actually where the nodal point of the lens is, so it's actually inside at the center level, not at the front of the lens, obviously. Um, right, and then we're, we had vibes, we had all kinds of stuff because we're solving, we're trying to do a mass distribution, you know, a wide distribution of this content, so we have to test things as much as possible while we're on set, which honestly, the difference between the headsets doesn't make that much of a difference because you're producing lat long, which I'm going to show you. Uh, but it is helpful. The headsets have different fields of view. Each one has a slightly different uh, you know, perceived virtual image in front of you. So usually when we do director's view, it's in a square format, which I think is a little awkward. Sometimes we'll crop it down to 16 by 9, which is more natural, but this is where we're at. Um, so that gives you a sense of scale. That's the three lens setup. <coughs> And then there's a few other just fun production stills. 
One of the hard things about shooting in VR is that you have to get away from the lens. Obviously, you can't. You're filming everywhere, and normally on a film shoot, you've got here's your camera shooting your shot, and there's probably like 30 or 40 people standing right outside the lens that are there to help with hair and makeup, or lighting, or electric, or whatever the thing is for that shot. Uh, in VR, we all have to rush in, do stuff, and then run away and hide in order to shoot. So we've got like, you know, there's, I have a collection of pictures of like funny situations where we're shooting on a golf course, for instance. And when you're on the green, there really is nowhere to hide, right? So we had a crew of about 20 people shooting. We put the camera right there on the green. He was about to do a putt. We roll cameras. We all have to run away. So this really hilarious picture of 20 people standing in line behind one tree trying to hide from the VR lens because that's the only thing there was out there. So another one of these kind of, at least for us, like a holy grail thing is you don't want to just plant the camera down and shoot. It's kind of boring. If we can make shots more dynamic, we will. So this is a steady cam rig, which this is like a, a very traditional steady cam with non-traditional things hanging off of it, right? So um, it's really tough for a camera operator to handle, I would say 50 pounds would be a very large rig. That's a lot to manage when you're free floating in space. Um, it's kind of on a suspension system so that it moves, you know, has a very smooth motion. Uh, and just by way of anecdote, you've got 24 cameras on the John. We use this device here, which is called a Theta, uh, which has two approximately 190 <coughs> degree lenses, maybe 200 degree lenses, that are on opposite sides of each other. And then we have, uh, it's not in this picture, but we attach another GoPro to his back, because as he's walking holding the lens, we want to at least make some attempt to capture what's behind, what part of the lens he's obstructing. Uh, even though it may not be useful in post, at least we have it on the day. So, at the moment, when he was shooting this, he had 27 lenses hanging off of him. Uh, which, obviously, once you hit record, you're burning gigabytes upon gigabytes of data per second. So it ends up being a lot to manage. Uh, what's interesting to point out here is that this camera is not used for post. It's only for live preview because there aren't really, aside from the Ozo, there isn't really a good way to film material and see live when you're shooting. So that really changes the game for film production because how do you know, if you have to hide somewhere behind a tree, or in a bathroom, or wherever, how do you know how well the actors did on their take? How do you know if they screwed up their lines? How do you know if the blocking made sense, or that, you know, someone didn't leave, uh, whatever, leave a C-step uh, in the shot? So we use this, which at least gives us some form of preview, even though, yeah, it's a foot or two away from the main lens, we can at least judge action and motion and, and just basic technical things that we need to know. So this device plugs into a Raspberry Pi, which is a little chunk of code that I wrote, that pulls images off the Theta and then redistributes them to a local wireless network, because the Theta by itself only allows one person to connect and see. It makes perfect sense when you're on vacation and you're just playing around, but when you're on a crew and you've got 50 people on set, and one guy's job is to look at hair and makeup, and another is... Uh, you know, set dressing on the walls, and another one is to see the actors, and so there's like all these departments that need access to that data. So this is where we're at in the industry, is this little kind of homespun thing is very useful, and I'm sure next year it may be or something, someone will have a better gadget, but that's how we do this one. I thought this was a fun image. Um, so that was shot on the Sony a Sony DSLR camera with a single lens down, 8 millimeters, which is seeing more than 180 degrees. But this configuration, even though it looks distorted, it is distorted, it's a fisheye distortion, but all the data is there. Right? This is the same type of image that all these cameras are recording, especially the, the 280 degree or the 220 degree, even each one of the John's individual lenses capture something like this. So, and we get into stitching. What do we do with all this camera data that looks like this to get it into a lab model? In fact, I didn't show you a lab model yet, so I'll do it out of order a little bit, but I think that will answer some questions. Oh, I did show that one. Sorry. Switching, switching laptops plus to me, sorry. Okay. 
So stitched. Um, so while we have all these cameras running, there's a few considerations that uh, we have to keep in mind. The advantages of John, there are lots. All of these lenses are gen locked, which means that they take a picture at the same time. All the shutters open at the same time and close at the same time. Most cameras, especially if you have sequences of cameras together, they don't do that. You have to do some kind of time code sync or gen lock um, or global shutter. So that's a huge advantage of this. It also doesn't auto-expose. <laughs> well, it, it takes a baseline auto-exposure and then leaves the exposure fixed for the whole shot. And white balance, obviously, is also a thing. And I see these things in contrast to the GoPro, which auto-exposes, auto-white balance, doesn't gen lock, and these are all problems. The Jaunt system has an auto-stitcher, so you upload material to their cloud system, it stitches away, and then you download the finished files. That's huge in comparison to, for instance, the GoPro setup, where you kind of just end up with the footage and you're on your own. You can do stitching with auto pano. We do all of our stitching in Nuke. Um, it's it's not it's like a love hate relationship, obviously, with anything that claims to be automatic. Where if it works, great. When it doesn't work, what do you do? So just a couple more things. Disadvantages of John is that it's really big and heavy. You can't move it around easily on set. You can't move it around when no one can be near it. That's hard. Um, the auto stitch has bugs in it. And in an ideal world, you would capture the whole lat long in one lens and not have to stitch it. But that reality doesn't exist, right? You, need a lead. you can't have the lens and the capturing mechanism. There's no way to get it all into one space and hold it up off the floor. And, you know, that just it's not going to happen. So then by contrast, when you have 24 cameras, it just ends up being more data and more work and more to keep track of. <laughs> okay, so this was a show we did for Carter Bryan a few months ago for Comic-Con. We went to his stage in Burbank and shot this. So this is like a very typical configuration. This is, uh, this is shot on a panel head, it's six lenses, an eight millimeter. If you just notice, you know, obviously you need a certain amount of overlap between each one because you're going to do a blend. You're going to do an undistort, and then a blend, and then a color correct, and you're going to end up with one unified lat long. So what we use in Nuke is called an ST map. This is a visual representation of an ST map. Essentially, it represents a distortion profile that gets you from and, for instance, a fisheye 8mm into an undistorted lat long space. It's, if, if you imagine that the incoming data is a mapping, right, so, so for instance, uh, if this is 0, 0, and this is 1, 1, right, in the red and green channel, then wherever I say, you know, just to pick an arbitrary value, 0 0.1, 0 0.1 on that image, has some position here on this edge. So when it goes through this transformation, it can represent the undistorted version of it. So, obviously, when you get all your cameras together, you get something like that. I mean, this is what all these stitching softwares are doing. They may not be showing it to you in this way. You may not be dealing with it in this way. Uh, Car VR, which is Nuke's plug-in system, does all of this in a whole bunch of different fancy ways, but effectively, under the hood, this is what's going on. Uh, do you guys know what Nuke is? It's, uh, I mean, do you know what After Effects is? So, um, Nuke was developed by a digital domain like 15 years ago. It's basically the compositing software that, um, you know, real high level VFX work has done. It. Uh, it has a million great benefits, one of the best of which is that it has virtually no limit on resolution. A lot of times what we're shooting, you know, if we're shooting this, and each one of these is a 5 or 6K image, and you add a whole bunch of them together, pretty quick you've got 20 or 30K worth of pixel data. That might not be your publishing format, but you might want that at the capture stage, just so that you have more options and you're not limited by how that camera rosterized the real world into a digital one. So this would be a common like entry-level, first setup type script. 
Each one of these nodes is an operator, the image comes in, something is done to it, more things are done to it, they're all glued together, and you end up with an output. Obviously, I say this is, this is like a primitive setup. In a real world example, there may be five or six hundred nodes in one script to arrive at the final product. So this is like our baseline stitch before painting. Then you've got to go through, you've got to get rid of the operator, get rid of the remotes, tripods, fix any inaccuracies in the ceiling or floor or wherever they are. Or you get something closer to this where it's been leveled out, painted. Of course, on the day I made this presentation, I didn't realize that I left a tiny chunk of the tripod on the floor. But one of my important points here is that we're seeing it in Latin long space, we think of it in Latin long space. It's always very important to view it in a headset at all stages of production. Because even though this seems like a big detail here in this view, if you view it in the headset, it's smaller than a penny on the floor. So it's a very deceiving format, but uh, you know, don't don't take it at base value. Like you have to view it through the headset to know what you're looking at. So one other important detail along those same lines is this is a lat long view. I have directors all the time. We'll be viewing a lat long, and they're like, oh my god, it's such a wide shot. Why can't we get into the action? Why can't we get up in there? I want to see what the actors are doing. Well, again, it's deceiving, because this shot in a headset is right there with Conan on stage. It's a very close shot. Um, so, you know, with the time and practice, you kind of get an eye for this. But even still, I would say, if you're working in this space, please have a headset. So we watch that. Okay, so the visual effects part. Um, so traditionally, you know, VFX I think calls up this image of explosions and dragons and Star Wars and stuff like that. As yeah, that's that is what we do, absolutely. But there's more. We also do cosmetics. We change time of day. We change location. We fix inaccuracies and mistakes on the floor. Like so often, someone accidentally leaves a strip of tape or something in the scene just because it's crazy when you're shooting. So that's also a large part of our work. Uh, within the nomenclature of VR, it's a little unclear. Is painting out the camera rig, is that visual effects or is that stitching? Obviously, the shot's not stitched if you still see a tripod. It's not ready for use in an edit. But traditionally, that would be considered a VFX task. So there, we're still, all the different trades and vendors are still trying to figure out the names of things and how, whose job is what as we split things up. On this project, we kind of ended up doing both, um, which is great. It just is worth noting that it, in, within this context of capturing data from the real world and turning it into a final product, all, all the vendors are trying to figure out who does what and how much to charge for it and what it's worth and what a good job is and a bad job and stuff like that. So, this shot has a tripod in it, obviously. Uh, the tripod's also casting a shadow on the floor. But this is the file we have on disk, right? And I, I say that because you've got to do some kind of transform to this file so that it makes sense to a human so that they can affect it, render it, and come back out with something more like a final product that is, is leading to the, to the final deliverable. So what we'll do is take this and apply a, a spherical transformation on it that points the camera straight down. Um, I mean, just a quick bit of history. Hopefully I don't digress too far, but this is called a lat-long projection or an equirectangular projection. Uh, there's good reasons for why it's named that. This might remind you of map making, which is like similar to a Mercator projection. It's not technically exactly the same, but it's close. Um, if any of you studied about Mr. Fuller, he was like obsessed with this and couldn't stand this projection. He spent a lot of time with geodesic domes, trying to find ways to make every part of the image spatially, uh, proportionately spatially equal to any other part. So for instance, like in this projection, I can just wrap it around a sphere, which is all the player is doing, really, is wrapping it around a sphere. But what that means is that the top is going to pinch together into a little point, and the bottom pinches together, and in the middle, there's a, sometimes you kind of unwrap it like a, almost like an orange peel or something. Uh, the disadvantage, though, is that people don't really look up and look down that much. They might glance, but they're not going to sit and watch the ceiling. But then, why are we spending 
20% of the image here and 20% of the image there on what we look at 1% of the time. So this is like a kind of a classic problem of how to, how to get it from the recording to the player efficiently, efficiently and preserve quality, especially if you're planning to transmit this over you know, LTE to a wireless device. Like you want to be as efficient as possible. Um, so, one method that's been proposed was proposed by Facebook, which is actually a cube map format, which would say, rather than mapping this to a sphere, we're going to map it to a cube. And each face is going to represent 90 degrees of view, and you only have six of them, and they come in a nice array, and you can create different resolutions of it. So there's a lot of merit to that, but it does put a little bit more on the, on the playback system. And it also... Um, it suffers the same problem. It's still top to bottom or a significant portion of the frame that now has been equalized, but it's still there. So one technique we use for painting is to actually skip into something like a cube map, but our tool set is slightly different in that we're not limited. You know, if you take a cube and divide it, you're going to end up with these 90 degree uh, tetrahedral segments that all fit together, right? 90 degrees isn't necessarily good enough in all cases. If that shadow that shadow is longer, a 90 degree view down might not encompass that shadow. So then it becomes a problem because then you have to paint twice as much, or you have to do two different projections and get them to agree with each other. Uh, or, for instance, it might be that it does fit in 90 degrees, but it's not straight down. You need to angle that projection in some way to make it more useful for your artist. So, in this case, it's actually wider, it's about 120 degrees. So if you imagine a cube that's been squished into more of a box shape, that's what this projection represents, and it's much wider than 90. But at this point, I mean, I think you can see how easy it would be to pull this into Photoshop, paint on the tripod, end up with something like that. This is the only part of the image that changed. And then our tool set, which we've written a lot of, inverts this transform back into a patch segment that exactly covers the tripod. And the reason we do that is that you you, you the the footage will suffer what's called filter hits. So there's a few different names for it, but essentially going from a lat long transform to a cube back to a lat long, you do that enough times, at each point you're actually destroying your data quite a bit. You're suffering filter hits or uh, round off errors, there's a whole slew of things around that. So we only take the part that was affected in order to minimize the damage, paste that back on the image, and then we end up with this. It would take a lot longer to explain how to do that stereoscopically, but it's effectively the same process. And then you take this times 30 shots per show times five episodes, you end up with a year's worth of work, which is what it took us. Uh, this is a really fun scene. We're going to watch this in a second. This actually has something that's more like traditional visual effects. Rather than just painting out tripods and doing cosmetic work, this actually has a guy in a black suit fighting another guy in a black suit while other people are trying to get out of the room. So, um, one of the methods we use, let's see, possibly one of the kind of most expensive and time consuming, but it's called rotoscoping. If you've ever done it before, you probably just got a shiver down your spine. Effectively, you're cutting out the image frame by frame by frame times thousands of frames. And in this case, it's stereo. Um, all, all of this stuff, this is what's so great about VR, all of the stuff we're doing now is like this little digital layer on top of hundreds of years of other types of development. So rotoscoping the term actually came from drawing on film itself, right? Um, so now we're just doing it digitally and we just keep the same name. So we actually have this this was 9,000 frames in stereo, which we had brought from in India for this sequence. Uh, after the people have been roto, then we obviously do all the cleanup work. And you can't see it in the still, but there is kind of a, a refractive quality to this character right here. As you see through him, he's kind of watered, which is a pretty cool um, effect that's more complicated than it looks. I mean, made more complicated by the fact that there is a guy behind him that we had to add back in. So we're joining and patching that together from other parts of the sequence, and he's effectively like a little puppet man that we're matching on top of the guy who's been cut out. So 
And then one more thing while we're on you know, historical stuff. We do a lot of our work in anaglyph, which is the traditional red-blue 3D glasses. You always have to view it in a headset, and you always have to view it in anaglyph while you're working. If you're not doing one of those two things, you're going to end up with uh, with problems where people are getting sick because things don't exist in stereo depth properly, or what looks like this is a straight line. It doesn't look like it because we're in that long space. But when something feels like it should be a straight line and it's not, so if I did a VR like a capture of this room and the architectural lines aren't straight, especially in stereoscopic space, people will get sick. Absolutely, because it defies you know the, the visual cues you need to judge the space. So again, just before I play this, one of the things we're still trying to figure out in VR, which I think this project I learned a lot from, it successfully achieves, is that you, well, one of the problems is, unlike regular film where you can control exactly where people are looking because it's one frame and we cut the camera where we want, you can't control that in VR space. You don't even want to. You want to lead people, but not force them into a particular view. So we're going to watch it here in lat long stereo, and hopefully, like I said, you'll feel like it's pretty boring and doesn't quite do its job. But then when we watch it in the director's view, we get a stronger view of how the how the viewers are experiencing something like this when they watch it. In a headset. Check me out. I'll take out my bridge. Thank <laughs> you. 
Where is that? So, I think it's question time. I was asked to say thank you.